Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to our webcast. So it's one minute after four here, uh, Central European winter time. I would say let's start with our topic and our webcast, Cloud Security, No Chance for Hackers. Uh, my name is Manuel Veit. I'm part of the Cloud Presales team here at Seeburger. Today, I'm assisting my colleague and subject matter expert, Uwe Heber. He's our CISO, and uh, he will tell you more about himself uh, just in a minute when we are starting with the webcast. Before we do that, uh, just a few organizational things. Uh, your microphones are on mute but please feel free to ask any questions uh, that you might have during the webcast in the chat. And we'll come back to your questions at the end of this webcast. Uh, secondly, you also don't need to take any notes. Uh, we will provide a recording of this webcast and the corresponding slide deck in a separate mail. This will take, I think, until Monday, but then you'll receive it via email. And now I hope that you are going to enjoy the following insights that we will give you. And I hand over to Uwe. Also a warm welcome from my side. Um, my name is Uwe Heber. I'm uh, the Chief Information Security Officer um, at Seeburger and um, will today provide some insights from um, a general perspective of uh, information security at Seeburger, but also some legal aspects which are currently coming up by European um, requirements. And let's start right away um, with the current situation shows that we do have Okay, I wait a little bit. You want to go or we want to? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Next slide. Sorry. I just no, no. Yeah, it's, it's um, agenda. I think is clear. Yeah. Now I see it. The current situation is that we recognize um, a huge change in the threat situation um, during the past years. So it was mainly um, evolving when since Russia uh, started his war against Ukraine. So we recognize that cyber attacks, hacking attempts uh, did increase significantly. And those attacks also um, cause often excess, existential damage um, on companies, uh, much more than we had in the past uh, in our old crisis plans. Uh, where we have um, discussed fire and weather disasters and pandemics as an issue. Those um, reasons, those reasons for crisis scenarios are not that important anymore. We are well set up against such threats, but uh, we focus now on cyber attacks, um, which are the more challenging threats at the moment. Um, now also the European Union, and I guess that most of our um, um, attendees of this webcast will come from a European country or at least do some business with European countries or European companies. So the, the European uh, Union responds to this uh, threat um, by providing legal provisions, um, which is um, stated in several directives uh, the European Union uh, issued during this year and will issue um, beginning of next year, those directives will are intended to create a much higher level of security within European companies. So there is the um, NIS2 directive, which is um, relevant for many companies um, based on a specific sector or also based on a company size and revenue. Uh, we do have the RCE, which is replacing critical infrastructure directives. And we do have DORA, which is relevant for financial institutes, financial service companies um, with very specific regulations. Uh, we expect that you as a customer of Seeburger possibly, or also supplier or partner uh, might be affected. Seeburger definitive is affected by NIS2. We'll see this on later slides. And we will now go into more detail about this situation. 
as I said, um, global cyber attacks are increasing um, very much. So we do have added, we, we have added some examples on a more um, general level, but the, the most important statement is the one in red. We as Seborg are recognized that almost every week, one of our customers is informing us that either he or one of its EDI trading partners is affected by some kind of cyber attack. That might be a ransomware, that might be a DDoS attack, that might be something which is just um, causing issues on the operational side, but also causing issues in regards to information security. This is a real threat and it's coming closer, it's near, it's not that far away. Um, so everyone needs to be prepared of this situation. Then I have said that the European Union did issue um, some general legal directives uh, which are relevant for all EU countries. Um, I have shown that here in a small matrix. The most important one, as I said, is NIS2, which is um, mainly um, forcing any company with a specific size or working in a specific sector to, in, to, to reach a specific level of information security. Whatever that means, we'll see it later in further slides. Um, Seeburger is directly affected by sector and size, as I said. The RCE is the uh, it's affecting critical infrastructure. It's mostly in the utility sector, but also cause also some other sectors. Um, those are very specific requirements. Seeburger is not affected by this one. And we have Eudora, which is relevant for um, financial institutes. Also Seeburger is not directly affected. So we are not BaFin regulated, uh, regulated if this is um, saying something to you, but uh, we expect that some of our bigger customers are affected and then this will indirectly um, affect Seeburger as a supplier of those customers. All those directives are starting already in October this year or beginning of next year, so they are already live. As I said, EUNIS 2 is directly affecting us. Um, the question is, how is it going there? The EU directive on a general uh, level is already live. It's active since um, October 2024. We in Germany are still waiting for local law transition, which should have been done by October 2024, but now is postponed to most probably March. Since yesterday evening, it might even take longer, but doesn't matter because the EU directive already rules the basics. There is also already available um, additional documents which um, describe in more detail um, regulations, specific measures um, to be taken, etc. So uh, we already as a company start working under the um, under this directive. Okay, next slide please. Then I said in the beginning that um, NIS2 is um, affecting many new companies which are not directly legally regulated by such law. Um, Seeburg is affected because we are in a specific service segment. So we fulfill the requirements as a cloud service provider and also managed service provider. So this is directly already a criteria why we are directly affected. And of course, also Seeburg has more than 250 employees and 50 million euro turnover. Uh, so also this is a criteria why we are affected. We think we we expect that in Germany, so far for NIST 2 and RCE, around about 3,000 companies were specifically regulated by Critis law, but now with um, NIST 2 and um, new RCE and DORA, we expect that at least in Germany, the number of companies will increase to around about 30,000 and with the other uh, European countries, uh, we expect another 30,000 companies um, who are affected. So this will definitely have impact and will also um, uh, impact most of you, I would guess. Now, how is NIS2 in general affecting us? So there are some articles within this directive which are providing some guidance. Um, what is this directive requiring? 
uh, Article 20 requires that the top management is trained and um, uh, competent to fulfill all the um, information security requirements by this directive. So this is now directly addressing top level management, cannot simply be delegated to a CISO like me, um, but needs to be implemented also on top level. They require uh, specific trainings, um, whatever it is, is defined in Article 20. Um, the, the more interesting article is Article 21, which defines uh, the requirement of a risk management system, um, kind of an information security management system, ISMS, and definitive also requires uh, defined measures for um, securing companies against threats um, uh, on an information security side. Uh, not fulfilling the Article 21 is directly, um, can be, uh, uh, invoiced by 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 penalties, uh, high penalties, like we know to already from the GDPR. Also, reporting at art, uh, the Article 23, which is requiring a specific reporting to a local authority in case of your company is affected by such um, uh, issue. There are definitions uh, within the um, in German it's Durchführungsverordnung. Um, um, Implementation Act is the right translation, um, which defines the criteria when a company needs to report to its local authority. In Germany, it's the BSE. And also not fulfilling the requirements in Article 23 also leads to high penalties or can lead to high penalties. Uh, Article 24 is interesting because of uh, this leaves open some um, cyber certification schemas. So that means, how do you know that you fulfill all the requirements of EUNIS 2 and how can you prove this? Um, so the, the authorities think that uh, specific cyber certifications can be used as a proof. Uh, we got the feedback from BSE that ISO 27001 not, does not completely um, fulfill this requirement but still also for Germany, it's still open what would be the specific certification schema, um, um, which can be used as a proof for this. Okay, next slide, please. And then for DORA, which is indirectly affecting Seeburger, um, it's similar to the NIST 2, but uh, has some higher requirements, is affecting very specific companies in a specific sector and has, depending on if this company is uh, very important or important, a uh, very restrictive requirements which are challenging. So Seeburger um, uh, luckily does not uh, falls under this important. Uh, we act as a normal ICT provider under Article 32, if this is um, something you want to know, um, but we are not BaFin regulated and therefore not um, an important ICT provider. Okay, that's the legal requirements. Now I hand over to my colleague, yep. who will Thank now you. go into more detail about Seeburger. Yeah, exactly. So we now know a little bit about the framework of this EU NIS2 regulation, which is addressing, as we have heard, the EU, of course, but uh, as we are a global, cloud service provider and a global company. And as our customers are also uh, active on a global level with teams all over the globe, uh, we are having not only our data centers in Germany where they are protected um, according to GDPR and now also in the future in this too, uh, but also we have data centers in the US as you can see and in China with local teams there. And what we want to say with this slide is that even that uh, we will be um, compliant to these two regulations, we are already, and you can see it on the right hand side, um, compliant to ISO 27001. Uh, so we have the certification by KPMG, an external company who is auditing us annually since 2012. So that means that uh, most of the EU NIS2 um regulations or let's say guidelines that where we need to follow specific security measures and processes are already implemented and not only in europe but on a global level 
Um, also, we have inter international data protection agreements uh, that said, so we have these um, global teams all over the world. They are following in the same way those guidelines as we do it in Germany. So this is why we have these agreements so that we can show it that teams all over the globe, Seaburger teams are following the same processes with the same uh, security measures. Um, then, uh, in addition to the 27001 certification, there is also an audit called e ISAE 3402. Uh, together with 27001 certificate, uh, this ends up in a so-called SOC 1 type 2 attestate. I don't know if it's the real uh, right English word, uh, but SOC 1 type 2 should uh, say something to you. So this we are doing on an annual basis since 2017. And also we are having the TSAC certificate, which is coming from the automotive sector since 2020. Uh, yeah, so we are prepared for NIST 2. We know how to be cert certified. We know how to be audited. We have all those processes in place. Uber, please um, take over if I have missed something here or if the main message that we want to share here uh, yeah. need some addition Only from your side. I would like to add that uh, besides Sebo has all these certifications and um, audit uh, reports, it's also that we uh, require this from our critical suppliers. So all the data center co-locations like Equinix or uh, Telemax or AWS, uh, we always require a very high uh, level of security, which means tier three plus as shown here on the left side of the slide, but also we require ISO 27001 certifications, but also SOC, at least SOC 1 type 2, better even SOC 2 um, certificates from our suppliers, as this also covers some requirements like physical security and data center um, specific stuff. Yeah, Manuel. Okay, okay. thanks. Thank you. Um, the next slide shows those three certifications or audits that we are following. I think I have um, put most of the information already on the previous slide. So maybe just to go into that ISO 27001 uh, for a moment. So this is the proof that we as an organization or our suppliers, like Uwe just mentioned, have implemented an efficient and effective information security management system. Um, so I think the most important part here is that we are fulfilling these requirements since 2012, as already said. Uh, then in the middle, the ISA 3402, this is the proof that the installed controls are really and effectively implemented. Uh, so those two together really are a strong, um, a strong um, evidence that we are fulfilling the high security measures that are um, demanded from us based on the regulations that are there in the EU. Uh, so again, here is in seven years, we are fulfilling this. And last but not least, the TSACs, which is uh, the, an effectiveness control in the, uh, coming from the automotive industry, um, which is verified every three years. Again, from an external auditor like KPMG. Um, and here we will have the fifth birthday next year. The next slide here, um, I don't know how familiar you are, if you're a cloud customer, on-premise customer, iPaaS customer. Uh, so here we have tried to show you the three different operating models that you can have with our business integration suite software and how it is affected or which certification is um, affecting which of those models. So if we take a look at the two um, columns on the right side, IPaaS and fully managed service. These are our cloud services. And of course, the certificates we just have mentioned are covering all the responsibilities. You see them as lines going from infrastructure to BIS release management. So the red lines uh, in the middle, these are um, affected by the certifications. When you have a fully managed service being provided by us, all the responsibilities we have for providing this cloud service, this cloud integration services are covered by ISO 27001. Um, and maybe a, it's just a technical thing. So the certific certificate itself is not 
um, valid for the development of our software, but as all our teams that are involved in development um, are working like we should uh, be working and the processes that we have installed like it should be according to the regulations that we have to fulfill, you can say that the BIS development or the software itself is also kind of uh, following the, not kind of, it's following these security measures. It's just not, um, so there is just not a, an official certificate for it, but all the measures, all the processes are the same. Uh, be it um, our software that is used on premises, be it a cloud service like IPAS or fully managed service. So I think this is something we wanted to point out here and also Uwe, here you might have also have um, yeah. a message. Yeah, I, I mean, that it's I... already said, but let's repeat it in my CISO yeah. wording. Um, yeah. So the CISO organization holds a general ESMS, Information Security Management System, which is valid for the complete CISO company worldwide, including all subsidiaries, all teams and groups, even if they are not in the scope of the external ISO certification audit. Um, we also ensure that um, our policies we have in regards to information security are fulfilled and known by any team, not only the teams which are in the scope. We also do internal audits of those groups, teams and service processes um, on a regular basis. But as Manuel said, uh, the external ISO certification scope is limited to our cloud services as the, those are the services we believe are the most relevant one. Also, the certificate is uh, required uh, from customer side as a proof that their services um, we operate for them are in a high level of um, security. Thanks. I think that makes it now even clearer. What else do we have? Um, we have implemented as well uh, different security responsibilities across our organization. Um, don't be shocked. I won't go into details for each of those roles. You have the names here. You see that those are six roles that we have identified uh, and that we have implemented in the company just three things that uh, or three messages that I want to um, make here. So the first one is, is it shows the value that I've information security, IT security has within our uh, organization. Uh, yeah, because we have these, um, we've implemented these roles, there are persons and teams behind, so there's a high importance, a high attendance on, on that subject into the whole organization. That's the first thing. Then as we have different roles with different actors, this also means that independent decision-making is possible. Uh, so we can avoid conflicts uh, in terms of uh, objectives or personal objectives. This is the second uh, very important part here that we want to share with you. And the third part is behind all those roles, our people, uh, people get paid. So you see that uh, Seaburger is ready. There's a certain readiness to invest and willingness to invest in the sector of IT security in having all those roles and all those people uh, being there just to protect our organization and your systems at the end, the customer systems uh, from internal, internal uh, and external attacks. So this is what we want to say here on this slide. That all those efforts that I just have outlined are paying off, uh, we want to show here. So there is uh, an external, I would say, security rating agency called Security Scorecard. I don't know if you, if you know them. Uh, this is basically a website. They are testing our um, domain, seaburger.com in this case. Uh, in all terms of security measures that we have implemented and we have reached a very, very good uh, level of um, 98, a score of 98 from 100. And uh, if you want, after the webcast, you can go on their side. I think now some to get some more information, you have to pay for it. But weeks ago, you could just uh, look for different domains 
uh, in the URL of security scorecard, and then you got the ratings, and I hardly found ratings that are higher than the 98 we have here. So this is also uh, nice to see for us that all the efforts we, we are taking every day in this area are paying off and is showing from external that we have very good security score in general. Um, yeah, now we have heard a lot um, about theory, about guidelines, uh, how we are implementing things. Here I just want to highlight the categories where we want to focus on. I think you can read through the individual measures uh, in the PowerPoint once you're receiving it later. After this uh, webcast, we just have collected some measures for, in this case, the area or the sector of physical security. So we are following here all the rules and guidelines uh, that we have to fulfill when it comes to, to physical security. Uh, we are doing the same when it comes to server and network security, just one example. So the IDS intrusion detecting detection system is analyzing the network traffic and when it comes to anomalies there is an alert and then the teams can start um, working closer uh, and see if it's a real attack or if it's, it's just an accidental behavior in the in the traffic that we have um, just as an example um, what software we are using uh, to detect external or internal threats then when it comes to identity and access management, uh, of course, you have to make sure that you have at least privilege access and the need to know principle. So you only can access what you need to do your daily work. This we are following. And I think this is uh, the same way every one of you should uh, also follow these rules uh, to reduce, I would say, the, the scope or the, the terrain, terrain uh, of attack. Also, application and platform security. I think we also already have talked about it when we had those three columns. Uh, we have a soft software development lifecycle, which is named SDLC, so a secure software development lifecycle, where we follow uh, security guidelines uh, since the beginning when we develop and um, create our software. Uh, so again, here, this is covered as well within the Seeberger organization. And maybe uh, I can I can sorry? support yes, here course. on this slide uh, something else. So not only development develops by secure development um, principles, also our software is delivered with recommendations, guidelines for hardening, for setting up the right, um, uh, um, for setting it up the right way. Recommendations about um, security uh, measures like we have uh, implemented specific uh, policies for encryption so you can create your own policy where you can say only tls 1.2 and higher is allowed for this part of um, communication um, and so on so not only the development group is acting but also the software is designed to support high secure environments of course at the end it's on you and seeborger uh, consulting to set it up the right way if we still, if you still have any partners who only support SSL version three, then you have to accept the risk that this is weak. But um, if you want to enforce that only uh, secure encryption, secure um, communication, and uh, also local storage, like um, uh, um, local file storage, is encrypted, then this software is supporting you and allowing this. Okay, sorry. That being said, no, thanks. That was valuable. Um, that being said, uh, if we look at information security in general, uh, just a few highlights here. So as you just have mentioned, Uwe, our software is supporting data encryption, both at rest and also in transit. So this also makes sure that when uh, processing uh, data in general and transporting it to your trading partners or receiving it, uh, everything is secure and secure protocols are used. Uh, then we also said at the very beginning, Uwe said that uh, also not only external threats, also internal th threats are very important um, to be followed. So here we're doing the awareness trainings uh, on a B annual, um, B annually. So everybody is trained, everybody needs to fulfill the trainings to make sure that everybody is aware uh, what can happen uh, with phishing mails and so on. 
and I think the rest, the TOMs we have seen in the slides before, the ISO and ISAE uh, certification and audit we have already seen in one of the first slides in my section. So I think we are through to through this part. And I'm handing back for the last section to Uwe. Okay. So what are the, la the, the next steps Seeburger recommends or plans uh, to do by ourselves? First of all, of course, um, you will have to um, manage your supply chain. So um, if you have the requirement, for instance, by NIST 2 uh, to implement a higher security level, then this will affect your supply chain. Critical suppliers and Seeburger in the most cases with its EDI software on premise or even in the cloud is a critical supplier in the supply chain you will have to verify that your supply chain is fulfilling all the requirements. We do this um, and we also recommend this to our customers if you wanna um, check Seeburger as your supplier. We do this that we recommend it in the following way. First of all, find the right manager for your critical supplier. Um, uh, it's not a good recommend, it's not recommended to use some uh, trainee and hand them over just the order send an email to my thousand suppliers and ask them all 250 plus questions. Uh, this will not gonna work. And uh, even if you get responses, uh, it's um, not helping you much. So find the right person who knows the service uh, the external supplier has can make a risk assessment, and maybe support you with the criticality and priority um, of the suppliers. Then check what your supplier, we, for instance, already provide on information. So we do have contracts. Our contracts, in my opinion, are good contracts. We define very much details of our service, um, what our service includes, also service properties and also information security uh, properties are described very well. Um, then we have also general information on our websites, um, on our knowledge base shown here in the picture. Uh, we maintain our uh, reference links to our certificate to um, specific um, security measures we have in place. So you can just check there um, and we expect that you would get out of this already um, 90 plus percent of the relevant information. Also our certificates, attestations um, like the ESIA report, but also FAQs um, is are a very good source for um, self-service. And this will give you already 99% of the required information you need for um, NIST 2 requirements. Of course, there might be questions open. Um, so it's, it's no problem to ask specific questions um, if there are some extra requirements uh, not answered already by the general documents or services and uh, service descriptions. And also we expect that our customers might have the requirement that we add on a contractual level also some security um, clauses. For this, we are prepared with uh, so-called CSA, Cyber Security Agreement or Addendum, uh, which is intended to add to the normal service contracts also the general information security measures we have in place, besides the usual TOMs we have described in the GDPR context. And we also do not recommend to make individual audits with your suppliers. Um, this is a high effort and will cause also costs on both sides. So instead of this, we would we will offer next year, uh, we name it audit convention, most probably October or November next year, where we just invite our customers here to Breton or to um, um, appropriate um, location and then answer specific audit questions you would ask during the audit. Uh, we can also show you evidences uh, we would not hand out by uh, security reasons uh, on, a, on, a, on a written way, etc. So this is what we plan to do. And this is also what we recommend if you plan to check your suppliers or check Seeburger as your supplier in this context. Then, um, of course, as I said, we are not 
NIST 2 ready 100%, of course, because NIST 2 is not, um, uh, is not um, um, defined in all details. I mean, we are still waiting for the German um, translation, tr tr transition, the, the German Umsetzungsgesetz still, the, the local authority here in Germany, the BSE, has to do some homework. So it's not defined and clear, but we expect that with the upgrade to ISO 27001 in revision 2022, which has already new controls, um, which are reflecting the current situation much better than some old, older controls, that's what we already completed. Um, we also um, will now work with the EU NIST 2 EU Implementation Act, which is providing some general guidance, some more specific requirements, um, especially when it comes to a reporting and some measures. That's something we are currently um, mapping to our ISO controls and also to our evidences and processes in place. And then based on the gaps, which will uh, be left, we will also close the gaps. Then, of course, we will also look if we can add maybe more specific or different controls to our existing um, audits like ESIE. We could, could we think about maybe adding some specific controls which can be used as an evidence also for the for the NIST 2 requirements. Um, we will still fulfill our planned ISO 27001 certification. Um, uh, next year, we plan to extend the scope of our ISO 27001 certificate um, by more services, maybe even um, support group, and maybe even if we are ready to go, um, already extend the scope also by um, our development. But this is still open. And we also think about um, what could be uh, the appropriate certification schema, uh, which is also um, accepted by the local authority. Uh, it could be the BSI C5, so we invest some evaluation into this topic, um, but not yet decided. Besides that, we are already registered with our local authority, which is the BSE in Germany. Um, so we are ready to rumble as soon as they provide um, some more details how to report issues and when to report issues, uh, but we are ready. We already have internal processes adjusted, um, like our incident management and monitoring process, so that we can evaluate what is a significant incident to report to this authority within 24 or 72 hours. Um, and of course, um, one of the more challenging parts, we also will check our own supply chain in regards to information security. And the very last slide, I promise, um, at least with content, is this one. It's just a reminder that if you start um, asking your suppliers for um, responding to um, security questions to um, provide certificates, um, also keep in mind that besides the information security, also other directives, um, legal requirements, whatever it is, are currently um, around us. So we do have the the, the, the requirements of um, sustainability reporting um, that might require also some checks on the supply chain. We have Lieferketten Sorgfaltspflichtgesetz in German. I don't know how to translate this one. So, which basically means um, uh, there are some legal requirements in regards to our supply chain. So, keep in mind that if you start a kind of a campaign to your suppliers, if you evaluate which supplier is relevant as a category one, so high important supplier in regards to information security, also keep in mind that other um, requirements might also be um, impacting this campaign. Okay, that's it. Thanks, Uwe. I think that's it for the contents, as you said. Now, as said before, uh, let's have a look into the chat uh, if there are any questions. We have five minutes left, so I think this should be ideal to take some time to respond to those questions. I can see three in the chat and I will just start by reading the first. So, to what extent are the security measures which are required by NIST 2 are already common practice? This is the first. Yeah, 
as I said, NIST 2 is um, a general directive issued by the EU. There will be local transitions into local law by the single countries within the EU. Germany did provide some preview, however they call it, uh, which already provides a good insight of what exactly in Germany would be required. Um, but I would say if you have already a good ESMS running, if you already um, do um, work based on a risk um, management system, if you already have state of the art, whatever this is in your country, uh, measures implemented, then you are on a very good status. And if you then also already have um, an ISO 27001 um, certificate maintained for a broader part of your business, this is already a very good starting point. Of course, we all have to wait for the final uh, definitions by the local law. Then we can say what's the gap. Great. Thanks. There is a second one. Which of the current cybersecurity threats are you most concerned about? Yeah, as I said in the beginning, of course, all the external threats. I mean, um, cyber attacks is seems to become a kind of a hobby of uh, anyone. But of course, as long as the international situation is the way as it is, uh, we can expect that the external threat situation will not um, become better. What I want to recommend is keep an eye on the internal side. So that means your employees, um, um, visitors, um, technicians, uh, whatever. Uh, it's, it's, very, it's, it's already very obvious that phishing mails are becoming more sophisticated. Uh, so it's much harder to figure out, is this real phishing or is this real? So there is a high chance that um, the company stuff is doing it wrong by accident. So we do not talk about the, um, um, uh, the fraud, the intention of someone doing something bad, but we are talking about um, mistakes. And keep an eye on this. Uh, go with awareness campaigns. Um, keep a kind of a newsletter um, where you provide examples of current threats, uh, phishing mails, which we are very good, uh, maybe some um, some some documentation on how you can uh, evaluate if this is um, fraud attempt or not. So this is my recommendation. Take care about the internal threats. Okay, thank you. The last one that I have here is what do you think are the biggest challenges for small and medium sized enterprises when it comes to IT security? Yeah cost, com find the competent uh, personal. I mean, in, in, in the EU at least, I mean, uh, we have many more directives. It's much more challenging to fulfill all the legal requirements. Uh, local national law is adding more and more. Um, you have the topic of sustainability, code of conduct, whatever it is. So this is forcing companies to invest a lot into those topics build up staff, build up specialists, um, which is, of course, um, linked to very high costs. So um, um, lucky Chinese and American um, colleagues, if you, do, if you are not affected by this, uh, you can offer your service much cheaper. But in European countries, I would say uh, the cost situation based on such requirements will be a challenge. Although I also, in my role, say, I understand it's necessary. So, I mean, the, the, the impact if you are hit by a ransomware attack and it's successful is much higher than the investment um, you have to take to avoid it. But also uh, be careful into which sections you invest. So I would recommend first start with multi-factor authentication, secure your accounts, okay, before you invest into a high sophisticated external service for hundreds of thousands of euros. Um, which is doing what, telling you that you were hacked as soon as it happens. So, you know, um, yeah, that would be my recommendation. Thank you, Uwe. So we are at the end, 46 minutes. Um, before I close this webcast, um, you'll be led to a website which is asking you 
a few questions about feedback. So this can help us to improve our webcast. So very much appreciated if you would just take that one or two minutes to fill out the survey and let us know what we can do better next time. Uh, secondly, there I want to just highlight that there is a next webcast in two weeks, which is done by Michael Bader. Uh, he's from Amazon Web Services and he will talk about uh, AWS and the focus on the technical benefits in a hyperscaler cloud. And yeah, that was it. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you have learned a little bit of about how we are securing our cloud services for you and how you can use uh, some method methodologies we use uh, to make sure that you are safe. And that said, thanks everyone. Take care and see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.